let's give a warm welcome to our host, Josh Gondelman. much. Thank you. Oh my gosh, a reverse standing ovation. <laughs> Everybody started standing and is now sitting as the show begins. This is perfect. Hello everybody, welcome to the 2024 Writers Guild Awards. That's right. Here we are together at the only award show that allows writers on the red carpet. Try that at the Emmys or the Oscars. Julianne Hough will body slam you through a table. I'm so excited to be here on stage at the beautiful Edison Ballroom, emceeing, that's right, so excited to be here emceeing the most prestigious award show that will let a bald guy host. That is huge for me, and it's not meaningful diversity, but I am happy to crash through the chrome ceiling with you tonight. Thank you. Historically, the Writers Guild Awards have had a lot of predictive power in the industry. Not entertainment, not the entertainment industry at all. But we are considered a leading indicator of the first round of the NFL draft, so not nothing. This year, we are the final event of award season. The Golden Globes, ancient history. The Oscars were our opening act. The Writers Guild Awards are the headliner of all the award shows. That's right, huge for us. Although it has been a little while since some of the nominated work was released. The succession finale was so long ago that since it aired, Tom Wamsgans has already run the Waystar Royco company fully into the ground. <laughs> so at long last, we are here tonight to celebrate writers. And a Writers Guild Award is a serious accomplishment. On the scale of writerly achievements, it goes uh, Writers Guild Award, finding an in-network therapist, <laughs> working on something your parents have heard of, and <laughs> Oscar somewhere in there. Thank you. I will pause for laughs or the sound of people finishing chicken. So either way, I'll wait till you're ready. <laughs> but who am I? That's a question we're used to considering when a studio exec asks us, so what's your story? And I'm sure some of you would like me to answer that question now. My name, as you've heard, is Josh Gondelman. I'm a writer, a stand-up comedian, a WGA member for almost a decade. Thank you. Thank you. And I can tell that some people in this room are trying to figure out whether they heard my voice on NPR or I just look like someone whose voice they might have heard on public radio. I'm also a four-time Writers Guild Award winner for my work on Last Week Tonight and Jesus and Marrow. Thank you. Thank you. If that didn't get a round of applause in this room, I was going to walk straight off the stage and start studying for the LSATs, as was my grandmother's dying wish. Um, I am sincerely, this is no joke, I'm a little anxious to be up here in a room full of friends, colleagues, and several legitimate icons of the industry. There's that kind of old hat advice, right, of when you're nervous on stage, picture the audience naked, but here that feels like super unprofessional. <laughs> Although, now that I've said it, I've started doing it involuntarily, and I don't even know, is David Simon even here? Because if not, I just pictured him naked for no reason. And <laughs> I'm so happy to be here tonight because I love the Writers Guild of America East, which, as you all know, is a small nonprofit dedicated to providing health insurance for New York City's playwrights, novelists, and stand-up comedians, one 10-week contract at a time. Some people in this room know me primarily as a strike captain, again, as has been alluded to. Yeah, thank you. That's, thank you. To me, that is a real source of pride. I'm so proud to have been part of our enormous group strike effort. Not that it was easy. Last year was extremely grueling for our membership, I know that. It was a real physical, financial, and emotional drain. But it was also so amazing to see the resilience and solidarity of our membership and our sibling unions. And it was exhilarating when we won a contract with so many benefits and protections for writers. Thank you. That's right. And since, and since the strike ended, as a show of enduring solidarity, I have remained unemployed. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? 
The WGA and SAG after a double strikes were a historic labor action and a massive victory for our unions. And we're hoping for good, uh, good contract news soon for the IATC crews, and we're ready to show solidarity with them as well. Hell yeah. But even now, months later, I'm having trouble breaking some of my strike habits. Like every time I hear a truck honk its horn, I raise my fist in solidarity. And a lot of the time, the truck driver raises their fist back, sometimes only the middle part of the fist, but you got to start somewhere. The strikes ended in the fall, but a lot of people are still getting back on their feet, of course, even some celebrities. For example, just to make ends meet, Jon Stewart was forced to take a part-time job working Monday nights. It feels bad, right? It's feels bad in the industry. Why would I lie to you? The studios are telling us to prepare for a period of contraction, which is also what you tell someone who's pregnant. And I guess that makes sense considering their business model is predicated on fucking us. So I gave myself one fuck. I could say fuck one time. And now I said it three times. I fucked it up. Fuck me. Um, now industry and starter, now industry insiders have started saying, just survive till 25, survive till 25. It's a little depressing that our industry mantra could double as the tagline for season two of The Last of Us. <laughs> or the motto of Leonardo DiCaprio's next girlfriend. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> One problem is many of the companies we work for aren't just making media, right? They're applying strategies from other industries and credit where credit's due. David Zaslav has turned Warner Brothers Discovery into the Boeing airplanes of the entertainment industry. <laughs> Yeah. Between television and aviation, this year has been really hard on the concept of pilot season. <laughs> a little wordplay. I'm not above it. The writers here tonight don't work exclusively in entertainment, though. One thing that's so special about our union is that we don't just represent TV and film writers. Our membership also spans several other dying industries. <laughs> The WGA East includes writers working in broadcast news for television and radio. We represent writers who cry. Yep, that's right. They deserve it. Give it up for them. We represent writers who craft promotional material. And of course, there's a strong contingent of writers who work in online media. Shout out to them. Yeah. My hope. My hope is that soon we'll cover the fastest growing sector in our entire industry. Three minute long ads for sports gambling websites read in one take by podcast hosts. <laughs> Once we get them, our power will be undeniable. <laughs> the landscape has been tough on news writers too. In the past year, online media staffs were decimated by layoffs. At Vice, things got so bad, they had to cut people's severance packages with baby laxative. I'm sorry, is that joke a little too in the nose? Um, fine, apparently no one here likes to party. Um, it's so hard to see this happen because your writing, and I'm speaking to the news writers here, is so essential. Without your work separating truth from fiction, I'd be getting all my information from memes on Facebook because apparently the minions have a lot to say about vaccine safety. <laughs> At least they work in STEM though, honestly. I trust them way more than people who do their own research in other cases. <laughs> I want to express my personal appreci ap appreciation for the work these news writers do, illuminating and elucidating difficult issues, casting light into dark places. And there's been so much darkness in the world, from attacks on abortion, attacks on trans rights, and the ongoing warfare in Ukraine and Gaza. And speaking only in my capacity as a mouthy little Jew in front of a microphone, I want to take just a moment to echo the calls for our government to demand a bilateral or maybe trilateral now ceasefire and return of all hostages. I don't. I don't think it's too controversial for me to say that no one's freedom and safety on this earth should come at the expense of anyone else's. Thank you. That's all. Now, now back to the other bullshit. Um, <laughs> And yet, while the world is so fraught with tragedy and pain, so fresh and present in our hearts and minds, we are so fortunate to spend this evening celebrating writers and writing. 
So now let's turn to the reason that we're all assembled here tonight, to honor the outstanding work done over the past year by the people in this room, and to a slightly lesser extent, the writers in Los Angeles. <laughs> we're, just, we're here and they're there, that's all. Across the board, the writing we're nominating and awarding provokes serious questions in its audiences. How can we create a better, fairer world? What does it mean to be a family? Is it okay that I, as a white person, enjoyed American fiction, or does that mean I didn't understand it? <laughs> and on top of the artistic success of all this work, 2023 saw some of the most massive blockbuster movies of all time, and all of them started with the scripts. It was a huge year in film for stories about women finding their way and men losing control. Oppenheimer, Barbie, me on the couch during the last 15 minutes of past lives. <laughs> I commence when, it, when I wait for the laugh the joke should have gotten. <laughs> That's when I come back. There's been so much great TV too, and I want to shout out my favorite drama nominee of the year, a story about people living in terror from a group of lifeless flesh eaters. Give it up everybody for the crown. Um, <laughs> some of my favorite shows of the past year are nominated for Best Limited Series, and I'd like to offer a special uh, congratulations kind of off the books to Grey's Anatomy, which is in the middle of its 20th season and is the only show nominated for Best Unlimited Series. <laughs> In our radio audio news script category, one of the excellent nominees is a program from Slate called The Ballad of Tucker Carlson. And I learned a lot from that one, yeah. For example, The Ballad of Tucker Carlson isn't just three and a half minutes of Tucker singing the Russian national anthem. <laughs> Who knew? In the animation category, four of the nominees are episodes of The Simpsons, and the fifth nominee is an episode of Futurama. That's a fact. <laughs> And I'd make a joke about that, but the joke would really be on me because Matt Groening is worth $600 million <laughs> and I'm doing this gig for past hors d'oeuvres and room temperature white wine. <laughs> finally, I know you're waiting for that word, finally. <laughs> As someone who's won a few Writers Guild Awards and who wasn't nominated in other years, it truly is an honor just to be here. And the real winners aren't only the people you see on stage accepting trophies. They're everyone in this room whose projects weren't quietly shelved for the tax write-offs. <laughs> the work writers do is so valuable. And by that, I mean both in terms of the information and entertainment it provides for audiences and the fact that it's a specialized skill that should be compensated fairly. And It is my great joy to help celebrate tonight the diverse array of talented people in this room and the incredible work that talent has borne. So just sit back, relax, and the next three hours will fly by. <laughs> Which is also, of course, my letterboxed review of Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs> and now, it's time for me to introduce our first presenter. How are we feeling about that? How's it going, Writers Guild East? Hell yeah. We did it. We got through the opening monologue together.